Intersex people have been in our communities for thousands of years. Uh, we are in front of you at the grocery store. We're on your dating apps. We're in your families. In focus tonight, Intersex Awareness Day. According to the United Nations Free and Equal Campaign, approximately 1.7% of babies are born with sex characteristics that don't fit the typical definitions of male and female. While intersex people might identify under the LGBTQ plus acronym, intersex conditions are not a sexual orientation or a gender identity. As a result, intersex people can be considered gender and sexual minorities. Tonight's in focus discussion will be intimate, personal, and even uncomfortable for some, but we hope you will find it insightful, educational, and informative. Joining us live in studio tonight is a person you saw at the beginning of this segment, Courtney Skaggs, an intersex educator and activist. Courtney, thanks for being here tonight. Thanks for having me. So, Courtney, I want to start with the intersex flag raising event today. I understand that it was a milestone for you. I'd like you to talk about that and talk about the event's significance. Yeah, definitely. Being there at the Utah Pride Center was amazing. Um, I actually met the first intersex person I've ever met knowingly in person there. Uh, you'll hear from her just in a little bit. But raising that flag was incredibly affirming. Um, it, I didn't expect it, but when Michelle from the Utah Pride Center invited me to raise that flag, it felt like I had a place um, and that I was raising a standard that I had never in my life felt comfortable to raise. What are some challenges that you face being intersex? Yeah, uh, being intersex and growing up in a binary world is not easy. Um, everything is, seems to be gendered or every single form that you fill out seems to be female and male and not intersex. Um, and so fitting into the male and female boxes our society has constructed and the systems that we have is quite difficult. The feeling that you don't f belong or that you don't really have a space in a place that is safe. What has your experience been like growing up dealing with cultural and religious norms? Yeah, those cultural and religious norms, those boxes that we create are really strong. Um, Growing up, I remember asking my mom if I could wear my khaki pants to church. Because in my mind, those were my nice pants, and I didn't want to wear those dresses anymore. Um, I felt that I needed to conform and never really fit, felt like I fit in or that I was able to be my true and whole self. Now, in your bio, it says that you underwent non-consensual, medically unnecessary surgical in intervention and subsequent hormone replacement therapy as an adolescent. How has that impacted your life? Yeah, that experience as an infant has long lasting effects. And I'm not the only one that's experienced that in the intersex community. Many people have been operated on as infants. That has long term psycho and social uh, effects. Uh, wondering if your body is normal, feeling like you needed to be fixed, um, and really feeling a lot of shame and stigma around your body can have some pretty lasting effects, as you can imagine. I think a lot of people, as they're learning about this, they want to know what are the needs of our intersex community? Yeah, I think they're threefold. Really, it's um, body autonomy, so ending intersex surgery and adequate healthcare practices. Number two, laws that protect our bodies and government recognition, because to be quite frank, the medical industry has been pretty slow to listen to our cries. So we need those laws to protect our bodies. Um, and then third, education, visibility, um, and community. Courtney, what is your favorite part about being intersex? I've got that question before and sometimes I sat on it for a little bit, but it's the community. When I came out as intersex in July, I connected with people from all over the world and for the first time in my life, I was like, okay, I'm not alone. The community is incredibly resilient. There are some amazing people that are intersex that have gone through some really hard stuff. Um, and so the community is just so strong, we band together, we support each other, and we love each other. So I'd say the community. And as people are watching at home, how can our viewers help the intersex community? What do you want people at home to know? I'd say listen to our stories, amplify our experiences, and then support intersex organizations. Interconnect is a great support group. Interact is a wonderful um, advocacy organization. And Intersex Justice Project has put immense pressure on hospital systems to change their policies. So I'd say listen, amplify, and support. 
And just by you being here, that's really helping educate people. I mean, to be honest, I didn't know what intersex was before our good friend Kevin reached out to us and told us about Intersex Awareness Day. In your perfect world, what would life be like for our intersex community? I would love to see a world where someone could say that they're intersex and the response is, oh, cool. Just like you're left-handed or maybe you've got red hair. It's just a natural biological variation. I would love to see the intersex community integrated into society, celebrated, and have spaces where we can have that joy around who we are. Courtney, we appreciate you so much for being here and sharing your personal and intimate stories. Folks, you've heard from Courtney Skaggs, intersex educator and activist. Thank you so much for being here tonight and sharing your incredible story. Thanks for having me. All right, coming up, we continue our In Focus discussion on a broader level, hearing from educators, allies, advocates, and activists about the intersex community and what can be done to improve their quality of life. Within the LGBTQIA community, the I is often silent and not even seen within the community at times. It is something we have to keep working to change, and today is the day that we work to change that. A monumental day for Utah's intersex community. For the first time, the Utah Pride Center raised the intersex flag in honor of Intersex Awareness Day, which takes place on October 26th every year. There are more than 30 medical terms for specific combinations of intersex traits. People with intersex bodies sometimes face discrimination, including in healthcare settings and as early as infancy. Tonight's In Focus discussion will be intimate, personal, and even uncomfortable for some, but we hope you will find it insightful, educational, and informative. Joining us live in studio tonight is a person you saw at the beginning of this segment, Sue Robbins, an intersex and transgender activist, and Michelle Anklin, certified social worker for the Utah Pride Center. Thank you both for being here tonight. Thank you Thank for you. having us. Well, Sue, I wanted to start with you. Can we talk about how common is intersex? So intersex it is as common as about 1.7% of the population. And the interesting part about that is that 1.7% don't all know that they are intersex. Uh, they find out through different phases of their life. And that's part of why we need this visibility is because people who need help and education aren't necessarily getting it. Now, Michelle, some people often get confused between individuals who are trans and those who are intersex. Can you help clarify this for our viewers? Intersex is a biological condition, whereas transgender identity has to do with your understanding of your gender identity. So trans people often fight for surgeries that they want to get to make their body more aligned with their gender identity, whereas intersex people are often, often undergo surgeries that they don't want. Now, Sue, earlier we were just talking about how intersex anatomy doesn't always show up at birth. Um, can we talk a little bit more about what kind of issues, whether it's physical, mental, or emotional issues that this can create for that individual? Yes, yeah, so it depends on each of the types of intersex characteristics. Medically, some things show up later in life because of the intersex characteristic. Uh, more, most common might be during puberty because of hormonal differentiations. Uh, others may be uh, mental if you discover something much later in life, in particular if it impacts your reproductive system and you've been working to have a baby and you find out you can't because of your intersex characteristic. So there's a number of ways that a person can find out throughout their life and that part of life when they actually find out can be very impactful. Now, Sue, what are normalizing surgeries and intersex genital mutilation? How are these surgeries harmful to an individual who is intersex? So what happens is at birth, a doctor will come in, and it's a problem for us in the transgender community, too, and they'll look at what they see, and they'll say that does not meet the norms of what we expect. So then they talk to the parents and then they do surgeries to try and make the genitalia look normal by their standards. 
the impact that has is as that person grows up through life, they had no say in what was done with them. They may have impacts later in life that affect their ability to be intimate with a partner or to have a baby. And that decision was made shortly after their birth. They had no say in it. Uh, we need body autonomy and we need to give that to everybody. Now, Michelle, earlier when we were talking with Courtney, we were talking about the difficulties with medical and health care. What do doctors do when they encounter a patient who is intersex and what role can parents play in this process? As Courtney mentioned, the medical industry has been a little bit slow on catching up with the needs of the intersex community. So the recommendations are to work with an interdisciplinary care team. That would include an endocrinologist, a urologist, hopefully a social worker, a psychologist, someone from mental health. Um, all of these different disciplines can work together to try and help support both the physical needs and medical needs as well as those social and emotional needs of an intersex infant or child or their families that are supporting them. Now we both touched a lot on the medical challenges with both of you as well as Courtney. Uh, Sue, let's talk about some of the societal or social challenges that intersex people still face to this day. So some of it can be very uh, predominant during uh, the youth. During teen years, there's a lot of development that goes on for a person. And if there's stigma and shame about your body, then you may not develop normal relationships. You may not develop any relationships. As you go further through life, the medical impacts that sometimes can come about if you haven't uh, been di diagnosed previously or even for some that have can impact your life throughout and you have to adjust your life for them. So we need to have the education up front so that those things can be minimalized and we can adjust to those and own our intersex bodies from the beginning and enjoy them. And I think that's why it's so important for us to have these conversations, right? Normalize, these, these stigmatize these topics and issues. They're not, they shouldn't be uncomfortable. And I love that you guys are here to kind of help us raise awareness and education about this. Sue and Michelle, hold that thought. We had to take a quick commercial break, but when we come back, we will continue our in-focus discussion on Intersex Awareness Day. Intersex people are born with sex characteristics that are not typical, fit into the male and female binary. Um, so we are here with some people from the intersex community to raise awareness and support this sexual and gender minority community. Happening today, Intersex Awareness Day. As explained by Interact, a human rights advocacy group, intersex is an umbrella term for unique variations in reproductive or sex anatomy. Variations may appear in a person's chromosomes, genitals, or internal organs like testes or ovaries. Thanks for sticking with us, and welcome back to our third and final segment of tonight's In Focus discussion. What an intimate, personal, but insightful conversation we've had so far. Before the break, Michelle Anklin, certified social worker at the Utah Pride Center and Sue Robbins, intersex and transgender activist, joined us live in studio to talk about Intersex Awareness Day. Ladies, we pick up right where we left off. I'm going to start with Sue again. Um, Sue, I want to know how come many people have never heard of intersex? Well, it's an interesting thing, and that's why we need Intersex Awareness Day. It gets very pushed back uh, to the, the background very often in the discussion. Even with the LGBTQIA community, the intersex community doesn't have as much visibility. And additionally, the shame around having uh, a body that some people think is different. And for us, it's something we celebrate and own. Sometimes there's shame in that for people that are growing up until they connect with the community and they, they understand that it's exactly the way it should be and that they should be owning what they have. And it's it, because of that, a lot of people aren't out there and that lack of visibility creates an environment where we're not very well known. Yeah, we just need to get the awareness out there, the visibility and the celebration. Uh, Michelle, what's wrong with the way intersex has traditionally been treated and why is it important to bring awareness to intersex individuals? Being told that your body has something wrong with it and needs to be fixed is a detriment to all intersex people. Um, and a lot of shame and stigma can come with being told that you need to keep your intersex condition a secret. As you heard from Courtney earlier, she didn't come out as intersex until she was in her late 20s and spent that first part of her life being invisible 
um, not having community to connect with, and that can really impact someone's emotional and social well-being. I have a follow-up question for you, Michelle. Um, what kind of language can we use to be more respectful, kind, and humanizing for intersex individuals? I've heard the term hermaphrodite, and I know that's incorrect, so let's help people understand this. That's a great question and really important for allies and people outside of the intersex community to listen to the community and what they have as their preferred language. So many people prefer the term intersex person, intersex condition, intersex variation. Another medical phrase is DSD, which can stand for either disorder or differences in sex development and we especially in social work and psychology are trying to move away from that disorder word because it's stigmatizing um, and we want to normalize these natural occurring variations in people's gender and sexual development. Yeah, it's a very isolating use of words. Um, Sue, where do we stand on intersex rights? How much progress have we made and how much more do you think we need to go? So some of it is tied to transgender rights. There is basically a Venn diagram between the rights of the two communities. So there's things that are common for us, like legal documentation and things that are separate. The intersex community needs different medical understandings. And even though the very first Intersex Awareness Day was in 96 and was a protest, trying to stop genital mutilation of our infants, that's still a big problem today. There's very few hospitals that have policy against this mutilization. Uh, a Boston hospital just announced that they're gonna stop and it was a big deal this week. So we have a long way to go in all these issues and it goes across legal issues, social issues, and medical issues. And Sue, I can only imagine how isolating it's been for some intersex individuals who think that they're alone. I mean, Courtney shared with us that she's 29 years old and met you for the first time who is a fellow intersex individual. Where can someone go to find support and community and what are resources that exist out there for them if they're watching this at home? So there's always obviously the online resources. Intersec, or excuse me, Interact, Interconnect are great resources. The Intersex Justice Project. Locally reach out to your Pride Centers because the Pride Centers will have programs and we have great therapy here at our Utah Pride Center and that's where you can connect. The biggest thing to destigmatize the way you might feel about something is to find others like you. And if you're stigmatized and you feel this sense of shame about who you are, sometimes you stay at home, you don't talk about it, and you don't search for help. And the most, uh, the most beneficial thing that can happen for you is to actually get out and make that connection. Find people like you who can help educate you, who can help you celebrate you and help you be you. And then when there's that next person, then there's another person, then there's another person, and it doesn't feel as shameful or stigmatizing as it might when you're by yourself. Very impactful words. Michelle, I'm going to give you the final word. Anything else you'd like our viewers to know about the intersex community? One of the first questions people often ask when someone announces a pregnancy is, is it a boy or a girl? And the problem is the question. So trying to rethink our society so we don't have these strict ideas of what a binary system looks like and making more room for diversity and inclusion can help everybody feel supported and welcome. Really great answer. Sue Robbins and Michelle Anklin, thank you so much for joining us tonight to talk about Intersex Awareness Day. We appreciate you participating in this intimate, insightful, and education discussion. Thank you for having us, Rosie. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, coming up, it looks like the cold temperatures are here to stay. But what should you expect as we head into the week? Meteorologist Adam Carroll will be right back with Utah's most accurate forecast.